The Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to Luke. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned to them and said, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot become my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If he cannot, then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all of your possessions. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the one holy and living God, amen. amen. Could I take an unofficial poll? How many, how many of you were raised in the Christian church? Doesn't have to be Episcopalian, anyone. Uh, me too. I was, uh, I was actually born into this church, particularly. I, I was baptized about four months of age in 1977. Uh, so I've, I, like many of you, have always had Jesus to some extent or another. Lots of people go through lots of different stages in that relationship with Jesus. Uh, for me, somehow, we just kind of always stuck together. Uh, for which I'm grateful. But I find myself, when I read passages like today's, um, I find myself wondering, what was it like then? What was it like then? What was it like to encounter Jesus for the very first time with with no expectations, with no baggage, with no history about him. What was it like to encounter him and be so inspired in that moment that you drop your nets and follow him? What was it like to be willing to just give up everything and go? I find myself I find myself jealous of that, that feeling of complete change and movement. Our rector preaches, you know, from time to time about his conversion experience. At age 19, he came to Jesus, and it changed his life forever. And he doesn't know, but I'm jealous of that story. I'm jealous of that story because there's this, there's this, this point in his life that he can look at and say, that 
was when everything shifted. That's when I became a true disciple. And for those of us who were raised with this Jesus that was just kind of always there, there's a question about what it means to be discipled. At least for me, maybe not for you, but perhaps like me, you have that question too. When Jesus in this passage says, you need to change everything, you need to hate family, hate your very life, get rid of all your possessions if you want to be my disciple. For, for them, maybe, maybe that all made sense. Maybe those nets were easy to drop in some sense, but I don't know. For me, I, I keep trying to figure out what discipleship means for me and for all of us who've just had Jesus all our lives. And so we kind of look at this scripture, we look at what is being offered to us, and, and these large crowds had come to start following Jesus, come to kind of hear what he's saying. They're sort of trailing along and hearing his preaching and teaching and stories, and, and I can kind of get the image in my mind of him sort of just getting maybe, I don't know, maybe rolling his eyes even a little bit and being like, look, <laughs> This isn't, this isn't just, you know, a day's worth of following me. This is going to be something way, way bigger. And yes, you know, most commentators and scholars say this is Jesus speaking in hyperbole, that we need to hate all of these things, hate our family, hate our life. But he's trying to get our attention. He's trying to say, your discipleship needs to take top priority in your life. And what does that mean for us to put everything else second? What, is it, what does it mean for you in your life? And then he asks us to consider what it means in our life. These stories of, you know, if you're going to build something, you don't just start building and not know if you can finish. Or if you're a, a king that's going to lead to war, you're not going to take out this little army when there's a great big army coming. You think about it. You plan for it. You get ready so that you can execute effectively this thing that you have to do. Jesus is saying, sit down. Think about what this means. Take it seriously. Because it will change your life. And the hope of course, the hope is that the change that occurs will somehow be one that balances out what might be seen as losses when we do them so that the gains are, are even more than we could ever ask or imagine. But we don't know, right? We don't know. We go by faith, which, you know, that's what we're all here about, right? We're here by faith, believing in something that we can't see or touch, but we hope that there's something there for us. And so, so I find myself in the midst of um, worrying, because I'm a worrier, uh, about everything. <laughs> Uh, worrying about whether my discipleship is enough, whether if how I'm living my faith is enough, whether it's what God really wants of me, and, and I'm called then to sit down and try and imagine uh, if my discipleship is really living out what God would have me live out. I don't have the answer to that. I don't know, and I won't know until I am pass from this life to the next, I'm sure. But I have two kind of guiding stars, kind of north stars, in terms of this questioning, in terms of this uh, uncertainty that I cling to, and that I hope, I hope are, are what can give me enough sense of direction as I go through my life. So the first one, the first, the first kind of guiding principle or North Star is that 
all of the all of the mystics and the contemplatives and the theologians and the, the everybody who really over the centuries have been have been connected to God, have really, you can read their writings and hear their stories and you know that they are in tune. They all talk about, in some form or fashion, the standards of this world that we live in now versus the sort of standards of God's world. And the standards of this world, I, I talk about a lot and we know are there they're so ego-driven. It's a success model. Am I achieving? What am I achieving? Have I achieved enough? And, and this ongoing, ever-present sense of, uh, I have to do it better, bigger, faster, brighter than everyone else, or else I'm not good enough. That, that just exists all over in our culture, right? So God's standards, God's worlds, the standards of heaven are completely separate and different from that. All, all of the, all of the hang-ups about achievement that we engage on a day-to-day -day basis in our daily life, th these are not the standards by which God executes his world and his vision for us. This is not, this is, this is not what we're called to. We're called to be driven not by the external forces of achievement. We're called to be driven by this, this still small voice that resides right in here and that is painfully quiet when the voices outside are remarkably loud, right? We all, we all struggle to hear who it is God is calling us to be, what it is God is calling us to do. And we're trying to listen and, and serve that voice, but all the while, these external voices just badger us. <laughs> badger us that these are the things that are important. Getting it right, getting it successful, knowing, knowing exactly how to do it. But that that's not here. That's not what the voice here, who is God, is calling us toward. And so, so while I'm in my uncertainty about am I being a good enough disciple, I have to remember that that question comes from here and not from here. I have to set those two things apart. And even if I don't know how to get the answer that I'm so craving from that still small voice, I know there's a distinction. And that's got to be part of what's good enough, that there are two separate things. Then the second uh, guiding star, north star for me, in terms of my discipleship is going going back to those blessed first disciples. And uh, those who've heard me preach several times know I, I rarely miss a sermon to mention my spiritual boyfriend, Peter the disciple. Uh, because Peter was a mess. The disciples really were a mess. They were always screwing it up. They, they got a lot of things right, and yes, they did the whole drop the net, and they went with him, and it was great and we can feel good about that but then I mean Peter's just the guy who was like he's just screwing up all the time saying the wrong thing over here but then all of a sudden he'd say just the right thing over here and then Jesus has to say get behind me Satan over here and then he gets it right over here he never he, he's never just a straight shot of getting it all right once he gives himself to Jesus and I love him for it I need him for it don't you because we're just not gonna be perfect disciples are we? Is there such a thing as the perfect disciple? And yet, upon Peter, Jesus built the church. He built us upon the example of Peter, this flawed, failed, wonderful, beautiful disciple. And so I cling to Peter because I won't be perfect either on my journey. You won't be perfect either on yours. But 
Jesus can still build on us too. Jesus can still look to us and he never lets us go even when we don't get it right all the time. And so the question is for each and all of us, what is your discipleship? What does it look like to you? How has it changed your life? How would you like it to change your life? Is it time to sit down and really look at your life and make an account of what it means to you to truly live into your discipleship in a new way? Maybe it's time. I can't know for you. I, I just barely know for me. <laughs> But I know that this is an invitation to us. It's, it's, it's not an invitation to, you know, bring everything back, all your possessions, and we'll have a rummage sale because that'll fix it all for us, right? There's more. There's more. There's the hope. There's the hope that the desire to please you does, in fact, please you, God. And, and we have to live into that hope however we can. And, and figure out what discipleship means to us. Maybe it means giving more. Maybe it means serving more. Maybe it means listening more. If you were here, to hear, if you were here last week to hear Father Jim's sermon and sort of this message he left us with, can we hear the voices of other people who need to be heard? Is that part of the discipleship you need to be called to? I hate this guess, but the fact might be that the things that make us uncomfortable, good chance that's the discipleship work we need to do. <laughs> so, so hear the invitation today. We're called to, to discipleship, whatever that means for us. And it can change us and should change us. And can we be brave enough to follow the call Trusting that, trusting that what will come will be worth it all. Amen.